Dr. Joe Dusseldorf. You're a plastic surgeon. That's right, I am. Um, but I'm also uh, developing a medical device, which is why I'm here tonight at the Medical Device Commercialization Training Program graduation evening. So it was a, uh, it's been a long few months, but I also wear a different hat as a medical device developer. So as a graduate of this program, how are you finding it? How has it helped your research? It's revolutionized my way of thinking about what it is that I'm trying to do. Ultimately, as a researcher, your goal is to public make publications or to try and advance uh, knowledge of science. But in medical device land, really what we're trying to do is to create new products for patients and get better outcomes. So to do that, we have to think more like business people and less like researchers. What are some of the hurdles that you have, uh, have had to overcome during your venture? It's really been trying to get my head around um, all of the different aspects of commercialization that I previously hadn't been exposed to. The regulatory hurdles, all of the different um, layers as regards to venture capital funding and what it actually takes to, to get a medical device through to helping a patient. So it's been uh, trying to just understand the whole process. Talk to us about your clinical trials. Yeah, so we are planning a clinical trial uh, in patients that suffer from spasticity, which is a condition that affects the, and the muscles and makes them tight. It predominantly affects children with cerebral palsy and also people with spinal cord injury and stroke. Um, and we're developing a medical device that we plan to implant uh, into the spinal cord that actually uh, reduce the amount of spasticity in the muscles. So it's a small pilot trial, 30 patients, um, and it will be conducted over the course of five years. Um, but it's something that we believe is going to have a massive impact uh, in the lives of these patients. I would like to take a moment of your time and ask you to imagine that just today you've welcomed a brand new baby girl into the world. Congratulations, how are you feeling? What, what did you name her? Catherine, Catherine. so Katie. So th that's perfect. Katie is, has just entered your life and she's perfect. You've counted all her fingers and toes, you've done the once over, you can, couldn't be more pleased. She's swung through all of her, pre -op, her, her, her screening tests and the hospital staff have said, you're, you're right to take Katie home. And you get home and you settle in to the lifestyle of a newborn baby, the blissful roller coaster of sleepless chaos, basically. And you're going along swimmingly until a little thing starts niggling at you that something's not quite right. She's just a little stiff, you think to yourself, and you take her to your local doctor to just get it checked out and make sure it's nothing serious. And then it hits you. The doctor says, Katie has cerebral palsy. You don't know what that means, and you're told cerebral palsy is a common condition. It affects one in 500 children, newborns. It affects 17 million people worldwide. You're told it's a permanent condition. There's nothing that can be done to cure it, and it's a lifelong condition that leads to disability, the number one leading cause of disability in our children. You are told that there are treatments, uh, they're not perfect, but those treatments ultimately are targeted at trying to reduce spasticity, which is the tightness in the muscles that leads to the disability. The reason you're told why spasticity occurs is because the brain injury that occurred somewhere during pregnancy or after birth is Unable, it makes their child unable to control the spinal reflexes. Now you or I, when we put our hand on a hot stove, immediately recoil because our spinal reflexes tell us that that's dangerous and we should, we should retract our arm. Someone like Katie doesn't get that, that feedback. Her brain doesn't control her spinal reflexes and they're on all the time, leading to that tight, flexed, spastic posture that you may associate with spasticity, you may have seen. It's difficult to use our arms, it's difficult to sit in chairs. Katie finds it difficult even to stand up in a supported frame. You're told that this is permanent, yet there's a huge amount of money is spent on treatment. Some um, statistics say that there can be up to $500,000 a year spent per patient on treating this condition, and yet there's no functional benefits from any of these treatments. It just improves their symptoms. So I'd like to now take you to a different reality, Katie's different world, where she goes to see her doctor and he says, yes, you have cerebral palsy, but there's a new treatment. It can treat your spasticity and enable you to develop normally, to develop that ability to crawl, to walk, and to run. Now, what value would you place on that treatment? What value should our society place on that treatment, I would ask? So my name is Joe Dusseldorp. I'm a doctor, I'm a, a surgeon, I'm also interested in this space. My number one goal is to try and enable parents to have that 
ability to watch their kids grow up normally, just like I have the privilege of watching mine. And I've partnered with an incredible team to be able to achieve this. We have Saluda Medical, an Australian biotech company, who have an incredible device that we plan to use, which is a spinal cord stimulator. Now, why do we think that would work? The problem in spasticity is that there's too much electrical activity in the spinal reflex, and it's the wrong type of electrical activity. And much like cochlear implants can uh, give the correct signal to the brain to recreate hearing, and permanent pacemakers can give the correct electrical signal to a heart to enable the damaged heart to beat in the proper way, we can influence the firing rate of the spinal cord. Now, it's been shown to improve outcomes in chronic pain. It's never been tried for spasticity, and we're, we will be the first to do that. We have already obtained $6 million in seed funding to, to carry out our first clinical trial in 30 patients. That will include children. Our next step will be to apply for Series A funding, and that will be mid next year. For anyone in the room who's interested in seeing the vision of a world where there's a far more equitable approach to disability as, as I am, then please get in touch, and I look forward to making that reality in the future. Thank you very much.